Praise be to God, there is no other God except God. In the video clarification, Fighting and Jihad, I gave a conclusion from verse 929 that we should not engage in active physical warfare with disbelievers because the disbelievers live in communities where taxes are paid today. This is because only a 100% difference in belief system would justify killing the disbelievers. And taxes do not allow believers and disbelievers to be 100% different from one another. Now, in the video, How to Find Your Perfect Marriage Partner, I concluded that it's allowed, although not recommended, for a submitter, a man or a woman, to marry a non-submitter. However, I gave this conclusion strictly relying on the fact that the Quran does not prohibit it. However, I was fully aware that there was something wrong in, wrong in practice when a submitter uh, marries a non-submitter. I would be seriously concerned if, let's say, my daughter or son would marry a non-submitter. I wouldn't stop it though, because the Quran doesn't stop it, but I would be seriously concerned, because I can just feel that there must be something wrong within that marriage. But despite this, I fully relied on the Quran not to prohibit uh, marriages with non-submitters. But I did this knowing that God would for sure, as he always does, direct me to identify the problems or prohibitions within such a marriage and tackle those problems or prohibitions directly and find the solutions for them. So recently I found what that problem was and the solution to it. The problem with marrying a non-submitter is that the Quran clearly prohibits having close friendships with non-submitters. And that's what happens in a marriage. And there's no other way around it except through payment for that sin, atonement. And that is how I understand it, as atonement through charity, not tax, charity. And I gave the explanation uh, to this in the video titled Living Together with Non-Submitters, Part 1. Here is what I said there. In the previous video about penalty zakat, under point 17, I said that if you publicly mention or admit a bad deed, which you did after joining the submitters, you should contribute an equitable charity for it. So clearly, I introduced the payment for the sin of living together with non-submitters as a charity, more specifically as penalty zakat. And then I specified it even more as penalty zakat for a mixed deed. Here is what I said in that same video. This simply makes you a person who has mixed his good deeds with his bad deeds. And for that, you have to give to, to charity, according to verses 102 and 103 of Surah 9. So early in that video, I classified the payment for the sin of living together with non-submitters as a charity for a mixed deed, which stems from what verses 102 and 103 in Surah 9 say. And you can check uh, those verses and they talk about charity for mixed deeds and not about the tax which is mentioned in another verse. So clearly, I initially understood the payment for living together with non-submitters as a charity for a mixed deed and not as a tax. However, then I had to calculate what the amount of that charity should be uh, so that it can compensate fully for that sin. And from around the middle of that video, I deal with finding that calculation from the moment where I said, but how, how much, much should you pay? pay? Now, I had a few ways in mind to calculate the amount of charity for that. But those ways seemed a little bit too long. And once I found a shortcut being slightly lazy, I took it. And the shortcut was simply realizing that even though the payment for the sin of living together with non-submitters is not a tax, the final amount of payment should be equal in value to the tax. And I give the justification for that in that video. However, once I found out that the obligatory charity for living together with non-submitters should be approximately of equal value to the tax, the devil tricked me and made me think of this type of charity as if though it was the tax itself. And I ended up thinking of this charity as a tax for a few months. Thanks to God, I did not make Friday sermon videos about it with that thought in mind. But I did send an email though, which was a hasty decision while having that wrong idea in mind. And while I was thinking of uh, the payment as a tax, I also concluded that it should also be paid even for the years before the person was a submitter, because the tax was designed for non-submitters. However, again, this is not the, the, the case today. We only collect the obligatory charity, no taxes. And obligatory charities start from the moment when you become a submitter, no retroactive payments. So I'm sorry for that email where I mentioned the retroactive taxes. And for any money which we collected from any of you based on that wrong idea, we returned it uh, to all of you yesterday. So the issue is fixed now. 
So this was uh, a case where Alban, the Friday sermon preacher, went for a couple of months beyond what Alban, the clarifying messenger, has uh, uh, authorized uh, him to do. Alban, the clarifying messenger, said, no taxes for disbelievers of today in the video clarification fighting at jihad, and also in the video clarification titled Limits of Organized Religion, where the collection of money is only limited to zakat and nothing else. And also in the video clarification titled Penalty Zakat, Alban, the clarifying messenger, gives 19 subcomponents sub of obligatory charity. And the tax is not included there on purpose. Had it been included, there would be 20 subcomponents of zakat, which is not a multiple of 19. This is just one simple mathematical confirmation that the tax is not part of the zakat, while the other types of obligatory charities are zakat. And we as co a community are only allowed to collect the zakat. Now, had we collected the tax, it would have been even better for us, which is why I, I made that mistake, seeing how it could uh, be good. However, just because something is good, it does not mean that we are allowed to ask others to do it. We should stick to the minimum requirements when it comes to asking others what to do. And the minimum requirements are the contact prayer and the zakat. That's it. Alban, the clarifying messenger, makes this clear in the video clarification titled Limits of Organized Religion. In organized submission, we only demand the contact prayers and the zakat, nothing else. So the tax is definitely not part of zakat. And we should limit ourselves to only having the zakat as a required payment for submitters. Of course, part of the zakat is penalty zakat, and part of penalty zakat is the penalty zakat for living together with non-submitters, which is a charity. And now let me show you how to estimate the amount of payment or penalty zakat for the mixed deed of living together with non-submitters. There are at least three different ways to estimate it. The first way is by showing that even though this charity is not the tax, its size or value turns out indirectly to be equal to the tax, which I show in that other Friday sermon. And the, that equivalence of size leads to the conclusion that it should be about four grams of gold. You know, two different things can have the same weight. If you read the first five books of the Bible, for example, you will see that many different sins or taxes or charities, they simply come down to, to, to the same value of atonement, simply giving away a goat to the religious authorities who would then sacrifice it. And in one of those cases, they have to send a goat away from the community, which is where, where the term scapegoat comes from. However, let's now go to the second method of calculating the charity for living together with non-submitters. The second way is to break down living together with non-submitters into smaller subcomponents and see which of them are, are sinful. Now, of course, we do not uh, want to know about your sins. And if we do not know your sins, you should not pay for them through the community. Pay for those sins yourself through reading the Quran, voluntary charity, extra prayer, and so on. It's up to you. And it's between you and God. However, who you live with must be public information. And if we know that you are living with a non-submitter, there's another thing which we will uh, also automatically know about that situation. We will automatically know that that non-submitter is not doing the contact prayer. Because if he did it, he wouldn't be classified as a non-submitter. So we know for sure that that person engages in a sin. N not doing the contact prayer is a sin. So let's convert the value of that sin into money and see how much it is. If we think of the contact prayer strictly as work which you do for your benefit, then the average wage in the world for work is $5 per hour. However, all the five daily contact prayers, including preparation for it, take about 24 minutes. One fortieth of your awake time. So given that for an hour of work, the global average payment today is $5, then 24 minutes of work would only be exactly $2. However, while work is paid by people, the contact prayer is paid by God, and God pays uh, every good deed 10 times, which makes the contact prayers worth not $2, but $20 per day. It is actually four times more, $80, for those who believe in all the messengers and the Quran, uh, which is us, because uh, it is doubled twice uh, for the two reasons. But here we are talking about the case of the non-submitter who does not fully believe that. And so when he is not doing the contact prayer, it is the same as stealing $20 each day from God. So that non-submitter is stealing $20 each day. If we multiply this by the number of days in a year, which is 365 days, then we get $7,300. So during each year, that non-submitter is stealing $7,300. And for a portion of that stealing, uh, if you are uh, also present, you are also indirectly responsible because you're living with him or her. 
Now, I cannot guarantee that you were there at the noon time or afternoon time or evening time because you might have been at work or somewhere else and effectively not living with that person. However, if you are sleeping there in that place and you are a submitter, you must have been there before you went to sleep, which is when you should have done the night prayer, and when you woke up for the dawn prayer. So you were present in the same place with that non-submitter for at least two out of the five prayers on average during each day of the year. So even though he stole $7,300 in a year, only two out of five of those times you were there present. So $7,300 divided by five times two gives us $2,920. So during last year, you were there when that non-submitter committed the sin of not doing the contact prayer equal to the amount of at least $2,920. Now, verse 20, 132 in the Arabic Quran tells us that when the time of the prayer comes, you should order the people around you to do the contact prayer. Now, if you did uh, not do that, you were a collaborator in that sin for the amount of $2,920 per year. You supported their living while they were committing a sin. And if you did order them to do the contact prayer and they did not listen, then you should have stopped staying with them, according to many verses in the Quran, which I will provide, uh, God willing, in the next Friday sermon titled Being Friends with Non-Submitters. But anyway, if you are still living with them, then you stayed with them. And therefore, you either broke one Quranic rule of not ordering them to do the contact prayer or the other Quranic rule uh, of living uh, with them after they did not listen. And the amount of that breaking held a sin of $2,920 per year. However, you are only responsible for a portion of that sin and not all of it because you are only supporting it in, uh, indirectly and not doing it yourself. So this, uh, this is a case of a mixed deed. And in the Friday sermon titled Atonement for Mixed Deeds through Penalty Zakat, you can see that the payment for a mixed deed is 7.5% of the sinful portion of that mixed deed. And the sinful portion uh, in this case is $2,920 and 7.5% of that is $219, which is equal to 4 grams of gold. So this is a different method of calculation, but we got the same result again, 4 grams of gold. So you should pay 4 grams of gold for living together with non-submitters because you are not forcing them to do the contact prayer when you should force them or leave the place or take them out of that place if that is your place. And if you, do, if you don't do it, it's fine as long as you pay four grams of gold in the cause of God through the community of submitters because the community of submitters knows about it simply from the fact that they know that you are living with a non-submitter. Now, this only applies if you live with non-submitters who are uh, above 18 years old because legally those under 18 years old are under your guardianship and you cannot kick out someone for, uh, for whom you are a guardian. That would be another sin. So it applies only if you live with non-submitters who are above 18 years old. Now let me show you again through another method of calculation why you should pay 4 grams of gold per year as obligatory charity for your sin if you live together with an adult non-submitter. So this is the third method of calculation. Let's imagine that you dominate that person and force that person to do the contact prayer. In that case, you would be enslaving that person unfairly, which is a sin, the sin of enslavement. The payment for enslaving someone should be to fix it, to free a slave. And the Quran in verse 58.4 tells us that freeing a slave is equivalent to feeding 60 poor people with a meal. Now, I ca calculated that the average of one meal in the whole world is about 3.5 uh, dollars uh, during this year. So 60 meals would be about $210, which is again about 4 grams of gold. So whichever way you choose to look at it, if you live with a non-submitter, we know that within that living arrangement, you are responsible for a sin, which is equal to about 4 grams of gold each year. And you have to pay for it through charity, through penalty zakat. Now, someone might say, why did we not hear about this method of payment in the past? Well, this circumstance did not exist in the past, after the Quran was revealed. People either lived in a Muslim state, where everyone was a Muslim, and the separate families who were not, they had to pay a tax, or people lived in a Christian state, in which case they either became disbelievers, or they were oppressed by Christians, and actually paid for that sin through, uh, through being persecuted. But this case of living together with non-submitters peacefully and freely, 
in this specific way only happens in democracies, which are states which are uh, neutral when it comes to religion. So this situation is only applicable in democracies, uh, which is almost all the world today, and it will uh, be so until uh, almost the end of the world. So you can think of me as the guy who tells you how the Quran applies in democracies, which is a unique situation in our times, which is why people might not have heard uh, these things before. It's precisely because these things did not happen like this before. Now, someone might say, well, democracies after the revelation of the Quran started in the 18th century with the French, uh, French Revolution. Why did uh, God not send a messenger then to fix the issue two centuries ago? Well, it's because those democracies had almost no Muslims populations in them. Islam and democracy, for the first time, properly met in our generation, which is one of the reasons why God sent the clarifying messenger now. So anyway, the conclusion is that if someone lives with an adult non-submitter, which only happens in democracies, they should give money as penalty zakat, which is equivalent to 4 grams of gold, 4 grams of 22 karat gold. Now, before they do that, there's a percentage discount from that anywhere from 25% discount up to 100% uh, discount, depending on which year you are living from now until the end of the world. And the exact percentage for each year is given in a table in the Friday sermon uh, titled The Global Force Behavior.